Irreverent, over the top, and smart as a whip. This is the Rob Black Show. Got an interesting email from a, I think, young person named Robert. Thanks for emailing from me, Robert. You can find me on email, rob at robblackshoe.com. It's rob at robblackshoe.com. Now, I don't know a lot about this person. He just emailed me, and there's a quick little form to fill out. Fill out. I can tell you that he doesn't have an AOL account, so I'm assuming he's not 60 plus. He's not doesn't have a Yahoo account, so I'm assuming he's not in his 50s. He has a Gmail account, so he, he could be anything, right? Um, I don't ask for age. I don't ask for income. I don't ask for anything like that in emails. But this is a good enough email to share on air, and I think there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot going on, so you're going to have to bear with me. I'm going to have to start and stop his email. Morning, Rob Black. Great show. I'm a new investor who's been listening to 1220 AM KDOW every day since 2020. I heard about this amazing show from the sister show, 860 AM, back during 2019. I'm 100% concentrated for good reason. Okay, first, let's start with that paragraph. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening since 2020. So I think there's an implication that maybe you were at home or maybe you had more time working from the home office instead of the, the office where the man is and they don't really encourage you to listen to financial radio shows. Second, welcome to the world of financial radio and welcome to the world of starting to focus on retirement. I think it's great. Downside here is that financial radio and television differ like gold and clay. I prefer Bloomberg over CNBC. I find CNBC to be like soft core financial news. And I'm kind of making that reference to nudity where it's almost like a bikini shot. <clears throat> Bloomberg is more of a serious wear a suit and tie to work kind of approach. So I think you need to find what works for you. And sometimes what will work for you is somebody who sounds like you, who's jibed to you, who could say things like, oh, I'm going to get you to retirement early. I don't promise early retirement for a reason. So I'd be very careful, Robert, on who you're looking at as far as gurus. This is an industry where you can pay for an hour of content. And it's tough to tell the experts from the people who are trying to break into the industry. Um, I think it's a great industry. I think there's a lot of stars. And last week, I highlighted a new podcaster named um, Katie. Um, and she's got a new podcast, YouTube channel, TikTok. She's doing it all. Money with Katie. Do I love it all? No. Do I relate to it all? No. She's a 25-year-old woman who's married, and she's not me. I love that. And I think she's doing a really, really good job. And like I told a friend, I think her dad must be a financial planner because she's she's pretty spot on on what she says. Okay, so back to Robert's email. So you kind of get where I'm going at with that. He's only been listening since 2020, not that long of a time in the history of, of his financial life, which is like 20 to 60 years old. <clears throat> he goes, my REIT yields monthly dividends and year to date only dropped two tenths of a percent as of date. Good. So what he's saying, he owns real estate investment trusts. And... He's saying that he's not getting hit as bad as the stock market and his, his dividends are kind of nice. REITs are an income, maybe growth and income category. Earlier in the show, I talked about hyper growth, growth, growth and income and income. I like REITs for the average American to own real estate because you get the business on top of it. You get a company that's not paying taxes because they're paying 90% of their profits to you. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, now, again, through time, sometimes laws change. So when I say 90% of the profits, that's what I was based on my knowledge. So errors and emissions there. Um, some companies probably get out of it in clever ways, but there's also things called mortgage REITs that I'm not quite as fond of. I'd rather you buy a business on top of a REIT, like Ball or an oncologist. If you want to learn more about REITs, go to investinreits.com. Okay. So Robert continues on. And he goes, I want to be more diversified when looking at its chart. It has to drop sometime is my guess. I don't want to be burned. Long-term, I believe it is one of the most powerful yielding companies out there seeing its past performance. So I don't know which company he's actually talking about there because he was talking about REITs and he's talking about looking at 
an individual name and looking at charts. I'm good with looking at charts. I get the idea. I would be very weirded out. There's a woman who pushes crypto as a Bitcoin influencer who's really trying to get you in her class to sell you trading techniques. And she's pretty popular. And her shtick is, is to kind of freak you out with what are candlesticks and uh, different ways to technically read charts, which are, are fine, but I've never met anyone worth a million dollars who is a chart reader or a technician only who is not in the industry, never met an influencer, never met a mom and pop, never met a stay-at-home dad, no one like that. So he goes, this might get me in trouble. My eye is on the big five right now. I'm seeing some good deals out there with 20 to 30% drops, but being careful of another possible 10% looking at history. Now, again, I don't know your, your age, but if you've only been listening to financial media for two years, I'm guessing you're in your 20s. And you're going to see 10 to 20% drops and you're going to see 20 to 30% drops. And you should, I think you should be accumulating through them. I've been maxing out my 401k every two weeks. I've been looking for new funds to put to investments. Last year, I sold a home. I netted easily a million in cash. And I've been very, very, very slow to get that money back into the market because I felt last year we were overvalued. Okay, now he's getting some names. So what I was trying to say there is he wants to look at charts. Yeah, he's got his eye on the big five, which I think we're going to learn about in just a second. He sees some good deals out there, but I don't think he knows what a good deal really is. He's just saying that because he's seeing the stock off. It's from his 52-week high. Is Netflix a good deal? I don't know. We're going to see after Stranger Things how many people signed up for a month to watch season four and then dropped it. We're going to see them roll out commercial services uh, probably by the end of the year. We're going to see them maybe start staggering their releases so that we can get to talk about a buzz of a show versus consume it all in one weekend. So Netflix is a big question mark, question mark, question mark now. So just because the stock drops, I don't see it as a good deal. I'm working with them on this, okay? Next in his email, he goes, namely Comcast, Disney, Paramount Global, Sony, and Warner Brothers Discovery, to name a few. It looks like some of these entertainment companies have better financial footing than others, and some even have dividends. I'm looking for a company that could potentially still survive many more downtimes like this. Long story short, I'm trying to diversify more, and it's hard. Yeah, I get that. So it sounds like he owns a real estate investment trust or two, and now he wants to get into uh, media streaming. Now is not the time for media streaming. Um, they're all being lumped in together with Netflix, and even Disney, who has got a great theme park business, is how are you doing with Disney Plus? Um, it takes an enormous amount of money to develop television right now. And it's more of a gold mine phase. If you want it to own something like media stock streaming, I'd say maybe 5% most of your portfolio. And yeah, you can go out and buy 1% in Disney, 1% in Comcast, 1% in Sony, 1% in Netflix. And then you're diversified into streaming for the long term. But if you're losing money or burning money right now, some people think your stock's going to zero. Companies like Peloton, who have a great business, but they're not making money, some people have $0 price targets. So what I would look for, Robert, Robert wrote Robert an email, is I would consider dropping your, your angle and slowing down and going with some index funds. You want diversification. That was one of the last sentences you wrote. Um, I'm trying to diversify more and it's hard. No, it's not. There's the S&P 500. There's Wilshire 5000. There's all sorts of great ways of diversified, in my opinion. The Russell 3000. All very well diversified indexes. Um, then you can get an international ETF if you really wanted to. But keep in mind in the SP 500, the Wilshire 5000, the Russell 3000, there's a lot of companies who do business internationally, companies like Sony, companies like Apple. So you're getting some international. What Robert's doing wrong is he's trying to do a bullet shot in being a stock picker. And stocks, individual stocks are going to have more volatility than a basket of stocks in ETFs or mutual funds. Mutual funds are very 20th century. ETFs are very 21st century. Mutual funds, there used to be active and passive. And an active portfolio manager would be like 
the GM of the year in baseball. Like, wow, he's a great team player, but he costs money. To get a great GM in baseball or football or hockey, you have to spend money for the GM. That's a portfolio manager in the world of mutual funds. In index funds, it just says, let's take a look at the top 100 tech companies. Or let's take a look at the top 500 companies in the United States based on revenue. Let's take a look at 30 industrial stocks that a committee picks over at the Wall Street Journal, Dow Jones. So it, it's a little arbitrary, but a lot more diversified. What I would do, Robert, since you've been doing this for two years, is I would go with index funds for a little bit. Well, keep an eye on some of your quote unquote favorite stocks, but go with diversification until you have $100,000 investable assets. Again, I don't know any of this from your email. And then once you have 100,000, that's when you start buying individual rate to complement what you're doing. That's when you go, you know, I think this company NVIDIA had a great past. They've got great revenue, quarter to quarter the revenue good, looks good, year to year looks good, margins look good, demand looks good. You're looking for metrics. You're not looking for, oh, I have a feeling. But thanks for the email, Robert. You got me a whole segment out of that. He said, someday I want to be a decision maker and vote on core company decisions. That's a little bit stretchy. <laughs> I'm not looking to show up at the board of directors at the board meeting and telling Apple their business. But I hear you. You can find me online at Rob Black Show. Need to work with a financial planner. A straightforward approach to managing your money. The Rob Black Show. A personal financial plan with custom investment advice. That's why Rob Black has partnered with EP Wealth Advisors. With over $12 billion in assets under management and more than 80 financial professionals at the helm, EP services were built with you in mind. How can they help you? Find out at robblackshow.com. robblackshow.com. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. In my 20s and 30s, I was a big fan of alternative music, alternative radio, alternative pop, alternative rock. Think of the killers and such. I found my niche as something that was defined me. I think we all do, I hope, um, have some sort of passion for the arts, whether it's music or movies or theater or museums. One of the things you could do, I think that would be great, is go to a museum soon. All businesses are struggling and they're all trying to figure out how not to fire people. And museums often offer a free entry one day a month. And that's the best date you'll ever have. When you get to introduce a little bit of art, and even if you go with a bro friend, uh, get a big sausage pizza or something masculine before you go. If if art's not your thing, and just try to enjoy. There's some really cool people. I saw an artist a couple of years ago out of uh, China who does art with just a pen, a big pen, and he goes through like ten thousand big pens, and just these crazy circles, crazy circles, crazy circles. And you look at it and you go, oh, I could do that. And then you start thinking like, like no, I couldn't do that. <clears throat> it's just, I think, good for the mind. Anyhow, not telling you what, how to live. Um, just telling you how to live, I guess. That's the right way of looking at it. Mark Zuckerberg's dad once said to Mark, you can go to Harvard or you can have a McDonald's franchise. Not a big fan of Mark Zuckerberg. He seems just goofy. Um, he seems rich. He seems a little out of touch with the amount of sunscreen he puts on when he goes electric surfing, when he avoids congressional testimony while he's on his electric surfboard. I just go, that's just the wrong message. I've run across him in the public world multiple times, typically him driving his cheap car, which is interesting to note. Um, but his dad once said, you can have a McDonald's as a franchise owner, or I'll send you to Harvard. And he went to Harvard and dropped out. <laughs> and Zuckerberg chose Big Macs over books. He could have made a good living uh, by most people's standards. The average profit of a food and beverage franchise is $90,388 a year. It's not unusual for McDonald's owners to make six figures. Wouldn't have been a bad life. Um, but certainly an interesting, what do you want to offer your kids? The youngest self-made billionaire woman in the United States. I was reading through her bio this weekend. Do you know who the youngest self-made billionaire woman in the United States is? It's not a Kardashian. It's Rihanna. 
She's 34 year old singer and Fenty Beauty CEO. She graced Forbes annual list of America's richest self made women for a third year. She ranked 21st overall and is the list's only billionaire under the age of 40. Now, I think some of these numbers are starting to fall, just so you know. And how you define them, they're starting to be changed on whether you own cash, real estate, or equity. What's interesting about Rihanna is I asked my son this weekend, who's a preteen, I go, can you name any Rihanna songs? He goes, nope. And he goes, I know Rihanna does like um, makeup. She's all over TikTok and Instagram. I'm like, really? She's got Fenty Beauty, Fenty Skin, Savage X Fenty. She's got Savage X Fenty lingerie. She's working on an IPO. I, I say good for her. She's a nine-time Grammy Award winner. She wants to work because she grew up thinking I'll never be rich. I'm going to have to work just to make a living. So she's still working to make a living. Um, she started a philanthropy fund. It aims to support and fund groundbreaking education. I think it's the coolest thing about some of the wealth we've created in the world is how much philanthropy we can do with it. Um, I'm a big fan of giving to relief organizations that help others. Director Relief out of Santa Barbara, for instance, I think does a really nice job of that. Um, they just have a team that are well paid, but they're a nonprofit and they do a really, really nice job of helping the world. Anyway, now I'm totally digressing. She partnered with Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey, donated a combined 15 million to 18 different climate justice groups. She's kind of seen as putting her mouth, her money where her mouth is. She's got her mind on her money, on her money, on her mind. Hey, it must be about the Benjamins. But not very often you get to say a person of color worth 1.4 billion, self-made. And, and I think that's pretty neat. I don't know about you. Zuckerberg's dad giving him a McDonald's or Harvard versus self-made without Harvard. I find that pretty impressive. So the word recession is being thrown around more and more, and it is imminent. It feels it. I've cut back on my spending. That's only antidotal. But also I went to Vegas to see a show not too long ago, and I was surprised how many people were not there when we hear all the stories about how many people are there. Now, I could be in the wrong spots because I'm not cool, I'm not hip, I'm not one of a kind. I get that. And uh, I asked a couple Uber drivers during the weekend, I'm like, where's all the action? Because they're certainly not in my hotel. And uh, he's like, oh, the Cosmo, the Cosmo, the Cosmo is real hot right now. I go, okay, so I was on the other side. But I get that. So the SP 500 ended the first six months of the year down 21%. And the big debate on Wall Street right now is where do we go from here? Do we get a rebound to basically try to break even for the year or do we go down another 10%? Here's my fear. And this is a realized fear. The Fed has been aggressive so far in 2022. Good for them. One minute. I think they need to be cautious because it's starting to remind me of the biggest mistake we've ever made historically in the history of the United States when we raised interest rates, when stock prices were going down in the 20s and 30s. And now there is a whole lot of different circumstances going on there with loans that were callable. If you had bought a farm, the bank could say, well, Mr. Black, you've got six months to give us back all that million dollars we loaned you for the next 20 years, but we need it back this year because, well, times are tough. 30 seconds. If I didn't produce said million dollars, they took my farm. But what the Fed is raising interest rates now are on consumers who get everyday things on credit cards. And what we need to get right now is Putin's war to end with oil and Putin's war to end with food supplies. Nothing the Fed could really do at this point other than make it worse. Find me online at robblackshow.com. An education first approach to managing your money. This is the Rob Black Show. Welcome in, Rob Black and your money. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more for the year. The year's halfway over. We kick off July. NASDAQ is up down 28% for the year. The SP 500 down 19%, almost a bear market, 19.7%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down 14%. None of those numbers surprise me. When you stop and take a look at a 10-year picture of those markets, none of them surprise me. Five-year, none of them surprise me. One-year, ooh, 
I didn't see that. But you don't see bear markets come. And this bear market is basically saying that the Fed got it wrong last year with inflation and the Fed's getting it wrong this year with inflation. A lot going on in that statement that you don't want to be raising the cost of money unless you're able to cut demand out of that. And the problem where the cost of money or the cost of inflation is hurting us most is not in the borrowing cost. It's in the end product of energy and food. And that's very problem. It's also, like you can say housing and you know things like airline tickets. I get it. But it's the housing, it's the food and the energy that are the killers right now. And because we're supply constrained. The Fed really can't, it's pushing on a string to think that we lower interest rates will cut down demand for oil. Yeah, on the fringes, yes, but not enough. So what we need now is for Putin to go away. A time machine to invent it, go back in time, take him out of power. Um, otherwise, it needs to play out with either violence, nuclear weapons, or time. I don't know. But the oil markets are not fixing themselves anytime soon. Over the weekend, six people were killed in a Chicago area July 4th parade. Uh, that's tragic, again, as we move past Uvalde, we move into Highland Park. Um, I can say none of this makes any sense. Yesterday, people went to a parade thinking we're going to have a happy day with my family in the sun. And it ended in tragedy. And there's a... I was a star performer in college in logic. My college professor called me a prodigy. There's nothing that makes sense. Nothing that makes sense about the death of children and the death of holidays that were meant to be joyous. Um, you just can't figure out the math on it. You can't figure out how to balance that equation. So it's a little bit cray cray because Biden just passed uh, automatic weapons revision to the gun bill. And it's interesting that most Americans over 60% feel background checks are a good idea. And yet it still doesn't get done because a few politicians are on the take. The NRA said background checks are good. Like even they say it. So I don't care what side of the gun debate you're on, but if you're a rapper who writes a song, about hate and you should make videos on violence there should be a background check on you before you get a weapon just my opinion i know you're saying that's a little bit too soon on this one rob but it's just my opinion the euro has hit a 20-year low against the dollar bringing it closer to parity in mid-recession concerns a little bit more bang for your buck if you travel into europe right now as an american the treasury yield curve is flattened the spread between the two-year is 2.8% and the 10 years 2.83%. Copper futures are down 3.3% today, suggesting a revision to our thoughts on growth for the next few years. The negative bias right now is a byproduct of growth concerns. And the growth concerns we could see is what I just brought up tied towards copper tied towards the treasury two-year yield curve, tied towards the euro hitting a 20-year low. If you take a look at stocks, which are being confronted again with the inclination to sell, uh, we haven't really put in the type of day that really shows people have given up. It's typically, typically called capitulation. And... It could be a softball game that you played this weekend where your team is down two to nothing. You're still optimistic. Your team is down four to nothing. You're still optimistic. Suddenly it's 11 to two. And you're like, yeah, it's probably not going to go our way today. And it's 15 to two. At 17 to two, you're like, we quit. We capitulate. White flag. We don't want any more of this embarrassment. Thank you. Take your bats and go home. That did not happen to me this weekend, but it could have. Um, last week, we had some interesting economic data points including non-manufacturing index and the JOLTS job open reports. Um, that's this week is the JOLTS, opera, uh, JOLTS opening, job openings reports on Wednesday, which is kind of one of those key metrics that Federal Reserve wants to see 
they want to see job openings. And if they get to be too many, then they know there's a labor problem. If they get to be too few, then they know uh, there's a hiring problem. There's a lot of misinformation, information you could read into Joltz. But the employment problem isn't our problem in the United States right now. It's inflation. And then, like I said, it's really the energy and food. Everything else I think we can kind of deal with. And we can, oh, new cars are expensive. We buy used cars. Oh, used cars are expensive. We go to car parts stores and get more out of our car. We can't really get around the energy costs because it's a world market. It's not a U.S. market. And food costs, uh, the food supply chain is interconnected. Very much so. Um, I bought two nice steaks because my family will split a steak. And I was shocked at the price. I was like, don't mess this up, Rob. Anyhow and anyway, um, will we get a rally? We should. We've been oversold recently. But have we put in a bottom? I don't think we have because we haven't seen capitulation. We are moving into the fall. And some of the research I was reading out of China last night is China just reopened. It's like five busiest provinces, but their next 10 busiest provinces are kind of getting kind of squirrely with COVID. And this fall, our pharmaceutical corporations are going to have to figure out which COVID shot to give us. Is it one that's based on the recent variant BA15, or is it one based on a variant from earlier in the year, BA1? And the more recent one you can get, the more antibodies you can get, but that just goes into, are you ready for this conversation? <laughs> like, did are we having a conversation about another round of booster shots? Yes, yes, we are. And it affects China and it affects the United States as well. Um, having just gone through finally COVID in June, um, it was a pleasant experience, all things considered. I laid in bed and worked out of bed for essentially three days. I did radio, I did television all three days. And I just put my mind to it that like, let's not linger in this. And I think my booster shots helped is my assumption because I didn't linger in it. <clears throat> but again, not the lead story today. Airlines are getting back on track after canceling thousands of flights over the July 4th weekend. What is up with the air lines? And it, it particularly feels like it's Delta to me in most of the stories that I'm seeing. American Airlines and Delta feared and fared the worse. Both canceled about 250 flights each. That's about 3% of their schedule. United Airlines canceled 120 or about 2% of its flights. So hopefully you got back home after the holiday weekend. And if not, hopefully you're not holed up in an airport somewhere in the Midwest waiting for that flight. Um, Buttigieg is warned of punishments for airlines if they can't get you home in time of $55,000 per passenger. What? You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. Resources to help you manage your money. Visit robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. Another Bitcoin disaster. Do I want to use the word disaster or am I sensationalizing it? I think it's not good news. There's a company called Valued or, or Vold, excuse me. V-A-U-L-D. It's a crypto platform backed by Coinbase and others. They said they're going to suspend all withdrawals, trading and deposits on its platform. They said this yesterday when the markets were closed. That's a little shady in my opinion. Customers have withdrawn more than 197 million since June 12th, which is kind of fast and furious. Part 10, the exodus from crypto. The troubled crypto hedge fund, Three Arrows, is filed for bankruptcy. So they start to add up. And the number of thefts and fraud now being used with Bitcoin, there's not a lot of good news. Maybe that's the time to buy. But Vold, a crypto lender backed by Coinbase and Peter Thiel, paused withdrawals, which is basically, <laughs> we've seen movies, and typically they involve like banana republics, where the dictator goes, I am closing all the banks, you cannot get your money. And then people are like, we need our money, we need our money for food. And 
you go, that's wrong. Like in America, our banks are open. We can get our money whenever we want, but not with this crypto lender. Um, and that's weird. That, that doesn't sit well with people. So I, I have some Instagram followings of influencers because I'm fascinated by their marketing and their lack of education and their lack of credentials. And yet they'll give advice on crypto. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to the day where some influencers get sued because they're doing a lot of financial advising without credentials and without a safety net. And I think it's very, very dangerous. And I think the SEC is moving a little too slowly to protect individuals from marketing. In my industry, securities, um, I can't have Joe Montana on and say, Rob Black is the greatest investor of all time. Rob Black went through a touchdown pass for my portfolio. It's not allowed. Because our government knows you're too stupid. You would fall for it. You go, Joe Montana? We love Joe Montana. And just like we'll wear anything Kanye West wears, we'll, we'll listen to any advice that Joe Montana slings. And it's not always the best thing, in my opinion. So a little more gun violence over the weekend. Not terribly surprising. Three people were killed in a shooting at a shopping mall in Denmark. Six people in an Illinois suburb. And those are just the main headlines. I think we're at 338 mass shootings this year, halfway through the year. Last time I checked, that's um, two per day, right? Somewhere in that ballpark. The past May saw the highest number of union elections in the United States. I'm seeing weird little snippets out of Amazon that say things like, if you don't work on Thursday, you're not welcome at our factory on Thursday, or you're not welcome at our call center on Thursday, or you're not welcome at our storage facility or processing plant. You're like, okay, that, that's weird to memorialize it. You just kind of assume people don't want to come into work on their days off. But what they're trying to stop is people from talking to each other in informal environments saying, you know, hey, uh, you know how you're making $13 an hour? I'm making $15. i am a man, you're a woman. That's not right. You know how you're making $13 an hour? I'm making $16. i have been here one year. You've been here 10 years. That's not right. You know, we don't get breaks. You know, we don't. And, and then they say, let's start a union. Unions could go away. And it would be interesting if people would see the role of the federal government with minimum wage and states government with minimum wage. Um, unions typically appear to me i like unions that help police help teachers and help firefighters and many many more unions trust me not just those i'm like electricians i think are a powerful union i think they're a good union i'd rather have my electrician well trained come into my home so that i know when he walks out that the wiring is not going to go kablooey and i'm going to burn my house down uh, but when you're talking about a barista you're really talking about cost of living you're talking about wages that they're underpaid that they're being abused it's a shame that the union has to try to address that angle versus the federal government or the state governments with higher minimum wage. Because I'd rather unions be more things that we absolutely have to have as far as protections for citizens versus niche restaurants. And it just doesn't, and that's again, me processing it very slowly and probably in 10 years from now, I'll go, oh yeah, that was right. They should have done that. But a federal minimum wage would help Amazon workers probably better than unionizing attempts for 10 years would help. And again, I, I don't, I'm not spending the government's money at this point. <laughs> this isn't my battle. I'm just the reporter on it, per se. Biggest movie of the weekend was Minions. And I've always liked those movies because as a dad, you take your kids to a couple movies and some of them just stink. Diary of a Wimpy Kid. I don't typically joke about suicide, but I was at my wits end about 10 minutes into it. I was figuring out, can I run out of the state? Can I run out? Can I call in a bomb threat? What can I do? I was, I was out of my mind delirious how bad that movie was. But then you come across like a minion. You're like, that's incredibly cute. I wish I had a beer while watching. I wish, you know, kind of thing where you're like, I'm really enjoying this. These are cute. This is well done. Anyway, <clears throat> Universal is the brains behind Despicable Me. The franchise is the rise of Gru, broke July 4th weekend box office records. That's something we haven't said a lot. 
the next avatar will probably break box office records at Christmas time. We've kind of known that one may be coming. We were weirded out to know that Tom Cruise has never had a hundred million dollar opening. And then he gets it with Top Gun Maverick where we're like, wasn't that 30 years ago, the first one came out and it kind of was, and we're like, Oh, Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> What's interesting about minions is this movie has been promoted for a long time. Tokyo Olympics. They've been on America's Got Talent. They have their own IHOP menu. They've got a Jack Antonoff soundtrack, which he's done some work with uh, Tay Tay, Taylor Swift. He's done some work with Lords. He's uh, the lead singer of the Bleachers, who are now starting to do arena shows. He's considered the guy that the producer that every hot young star wants to work with. <clears throat> he put together a good team for the soundtrack of Minions. So he gets a lot of movie work now. Uh, Generation Z kind of got snarky and kind of got funny. I started posting pictures of um, the five guys from Sopranos, real tough guys. And they're like, let's go, let's get five tickets to see Minions, Rise of the Crew, and wear suits like they did on Sopranos, wear suits like they did in the Mafia, wear suits like, and it's interesting because it's actually really helping box sell, office sales. And yet movie theater chains are like, they're weary now when teenage boys come in dressed to the nines and suits and ties kind of celebrating their childhood, kind of memeing together, kind of taking photos and acting like they're at a premiere. They're trying to ban them. I'm like, you realize these are seats. These are tickets. Just get another one security officer for those 10 people that show up in suits. You'll be fine. Don't ban, embrace. That's a hell of a good marketing campaign for Minions. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, or Rob Black Show. Find us at robblackshow.com. Robblackshow.com. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Markets open down as Wall Street grapples re- with recession concerns. Recessions are not the end all be all death of anything. <clears throat> I like them because they're the best way of handling inflation. The best example I can give is I moved to the Bay Area in 2000, 2001, and the Bay Area was at the end of the 1990s where Yahoo and Google and a lot of tech companies had gone explosive on their growth trajectory and corporations were embracing the internet as more than just a big brochure. <clears throat> so when I, I come out from the East Coast to the West Coast, I instantly noticed all the restaurants are filled. Um, I realized that my six-figure job was common, not uncommon. Uh, on the East Coast, I was kind of a big deal. On the West Coast, I was kind of just one of many. And then suddenly, when the recession hits in 2000, 2001, 2002, the tech recession in particular, when we had commercials of a rocket, a monkey riding a rocket at the he- top of the NASDAQ <clears throat> in a Super Bowl, in one of the most expensive ads of all time, that was the sign that we were about to bust. I think crypto was a sign that we were about to bust when it goes on a tear that it did. The NASDAQ on a tear that it did in the, uh, 2020. On semiconductors that were growing at 30% year over year, their stock would be up 200% year over year. But the revenues are only up 30% year over year. And you're like, <clears throat> well, we got to have it. Because that's growth. Growth at any price. Those days are dead. Those days are over. I think we're in a higher rate interest rate environment until we're not. I'll let you know when that's the case. The Federal Reserve is expected to raise interest rates 75 basis points in July. I think they are right in trying to be aggressive. I think they're wrong in that it's going to work. I think we should be in a higher interest rate environment because I think the low interest rates cause this crazy rocket fuel for housing. If the Fed's higher interest rates accomplish one thing and bring housing prices down, that would be lovely. Um, because I don't think it's going to do a lot against oil. And I don't think it's going to do anything against food. It's going to hurt the average American consumer who is living with credit cards. Um, but again, that's what I'm seeing. Rising interest rates to tame demand and therefore inflation is not the right solution as high prices have been mainly driven by supply chain shocks in Russia and China. With China having COVID, are we going to open our economy? Are we going to close our economy? Are we going to open our economy? Are we going to close our economy? Are are the ships full yet? Are they backing up yet? Are we going to loading ships? 
then you get this weird thing going on in a lot of industries like uh, the airline industry where pilots are going on strike asking for more money right at a time where we need pilots to fly to keep us safe in the air good time to strike um supply is very difficult to manage and i don't think the federal reserve is going to be able to do much with it the fed are the first ones to put their hands and say monetary policy can't do everything so they've told us that um so that brings us into the question of what's one thing that biden can do that would help because he's in the middle of a midterm election which will basically be if more democrats are elected than republican it's a mandate we love you joe and if more republicans are elected than democrats it'll be a mandate on joe's gotta go that's the thought. With that being said, what's one thing that Joe can do as president of the United States? He can undo some of the damage that Trump did, and Trump did it correctly or incorrectly, is up to the eye of the beholder. Um, and I'm, I'm fair with that. I'm being very, very fair with that. But there's an Eric Clapton song called I Shot the Sheriff. But I did not. Was that or was that Barley? Ooh, or was it both? Uh-oh. Um, so I shot the tariff is the Rob Black original song that will not be hitting number one, nor will it be played by Clapton or a Marley relative. A blistering March 2018 report by the Office of the United States Trade Representative set the stage for today. The agency found widespread abuse of intellectual property and technology rights in China as experts estimated that Chinese intellectual property theft cost the United States $225 billion to $600 billion per year. In retaliation, Trump administration placed tariffs of 7.5% to 25% on Chinese imports worth roughly $370 billion. That raised prices on everything from closed bicycles to Bluetooth devices. Anything that was coming into the United States if it had a tariff of 7.5% to 25% because it was in a, a shipping container from China, China just raised prices. They said, you deal with the, the uh, tariffs. We're just going to raise prices and we'll be fine. So the White House could try to adjust, could, could try to address consumer costs if they want to play nice with China. And China is now in the position of, you want to play nice, you come to us. So if the Biden administration could roll back some of the China tariffs, any progress towards inflation, however, may sacrifice much needed leverage over competing economic superpower. Um, that would be an area of of... Joe could pull up, probably pull something off that would help inflation in the short term for the holiday season. In 2020, China promised to increase U.S. imports by $200 billion above the 200,017 levels and tighten its IP rules to resolve trade disputes, but it hasn't gotten there yet. So maybe we meet in the middle and go, we're hurting, you're probably hurting, how can we do this together? Something has to happen here. Higher interest rates are not going to solve the problem. Recession will solve the problem, but in theory, we want to stay out of a recession. So dealing with the world's second largest economy, it's stressful. And it's getting by and ridiculed by the likes of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. The president called on gas companies to lower the prices they charge consumers, which Bezos slammed as either straight ahead misdirection or a deep misunderstanding of basic market dynamics. And it's interesting that both Musk and Bezos have become more politically charged in their tweets than they were under the Trump administration and some of the stresses that they had to deal with during his administration. Recessions tend to bring out the best. I don't know. Is that fair to say? Anyhow, a big crypto lender vault pause withdrawals as the market crash takes its toll. Uh, I'm still not ready for investing in crypto. I'd be very, very cautious on that. I would, if you consider it, I would say this is the craziest thing I'm going to own. I probably don't have to own a lot of it if it does what I want it to do. But I'll tell you right now, it's still not settled. Crypto lender Nexo is offering to buy the embattled rival Vault as markets consolidate. This is good for the market. What's interesting about this crash in crypto, and I need to be very clear about this. I don't think crypto goes to zero. In the last three years, too many associates that I know have left hedge funds to work in the crypto world. 
a good college friend of mine is a leading thought provider on crypto. And he's doing a lot of crypto work on auctions. So have you ever gone to your kid's school and they have a big end of the year party and they try to get you, they auction off a date with a, not a date with a teacher, like a bowling date with your kids and the teacher. They auction off things like trips to firehouses and maybe front row seats to a music festival. <clears throat> so my friend's working in Bitcoin and blockchain to basically track charitable donations. There's some really, really cool things happening by some really, really smart people in blockchain. I'm not sold on NFTs. There are, I think there's a niche there for sure. Baseball cards, football cards, make things that are super collectible, super collectible. But I'm not going to be buying the artwork of a famous digital artist. That's not my thing. So I'm not thinking crypto goes to zero. I'm not thinking that it's dead forever. I'm thinking a consolidation. And when you see things like a crypto lender Nexo offering to buy Vault, that's a good thing. Consolidation is a good thing. And on top of it, I want to see innovation. So now is the time for them to say, you know, this coin's really not working. Let's kick it out. The Shibu Inu coin, we don't quite have a purpose for it. So let's kick it out. Let's delegitimize the losers or delegitimize the speculators and legitimize the really cool ideas that crypto has embraced. I still have no skin in the game. I'm still waiting for the right moment or the right understanding. I'm doing everything I can to stay in touch and in tune with it. Um, consolidation is not a bad thing. What's interesting to note about consolidation in 2000, 2001, 2002 in the tech market, it probably hit a lot of companies that were going to go bankrupt. When companies like GeoCities suddenly put themselves up for sale, and there was a company called Digital Cities, which was just like GeoCities, that also put themselves up for sale. And there's companies like pets.com that got acquired by a pet store that had real physical locations um, <clears throat> only to see Chewy come out with a subscription service of pets.com, which is pretty similar, but it's more social. They introduced a social component to online food ordering of pet food. And they've even done things like upload a picture of your dog and we may send you an oil painted picture of him. Like, Ooh, in they, the emails are to your dog. They're not to you. <clears throat> Pet owners are cuckoo enough that they love that kind of stuff. Anyhow, and anyway, I'm Rob Black. You're not. You can find me online at robblackshow.com. It's robblackshow.com. I work for EP Wealth. I work with a lot of certified financial planners that will help get you to retirement and then help keep your wealth in retirement. If you need a referral to a financial planner, drop me an email, rob at robblackshow.com. It's rob at robblackshow.com.